John Wick. The violent scene begins with a loud crash as John's car hits a wall. John, hurt and bruised, emerges, looking very sad. He holds his stomach in pain, haunted by memories mixed with the hurting he feels. A few days earlier, John woke up to a life filled with sadness and loss. Memories of times with his late wife, Helen, filled his mind. The memories swung between happy dinners and the sad moment of Helen falling into his arms. The story takes us to a hospital scene with John by Helen's side, kissing her forehead as a sad event hangs in the air. John goes to his wife's funeral and meets his friend Marcus afterward. Marcus checks on him, and they talk. Marcus is just catching up with an old friend. After the service, we see John at home, cleaning up when the doorbell rings. A delivery woman brings a package from Ellen, John's late wife. It's a small beagle with a letter saying, Ellen accepted her death and wants John to love again, starting with the puppy. John reads the letter, cries, and names the dog Daisy. John takes good care of Daisy, and they become close. He sets up a small bed for her near him. The next day, John realizes he doesn't have proper dog food. He gives Daisy regular cereal for now, but promises to get dog food later. They go to the local store, and at a gas station, three Russian mobsters, including Yosef Tarasov, approach John's car. Joseph, one of the mobsters, talks to John about the car. John says it's not for sale, and Joseph insults him in Russian. John, who understands Russian, insults him back. Joseph gets angry but is pulled back by a friend, and they leave. That night, Daisy barks, needing to go out. John takes her downstairs, but two masked men are there. As John faces them, a third hits him on the head. The three men beat John while Daisy whines. They demand car keys in Russian, breaking things. Daisy hides under a table, whining until one of the men breaks her neck. The man reveals himself as Yosef and knocks John out. Later, when John wakes up, he goes to his lifeless pet, lies beside it, strokes her head, buries the dog, and then starts cleaning the mess in his house. Memories of his wife and the attack from last night fill his mind. Joseph takes John's Mustang to Aurelio's store. Joseph asks Aurelio for clean papers and a new number plate for the car. Aurelio recognizes the car and asks where Joseph got it. Joseph brags about stealing the car and killing the owner's dog. Aurelio tells him to leave, but Joseph says they own him. Aurelio clarifies that he doesn't work for Joseph, but works with his father. Aurelio hits Joseph in the face. One henchman pulls out a gun, but the other stops him. Joseph insults Aurelio and threatens to take his business elsewhere. John regains his senses, looks around his house, and goes straight to Aurelio's shop. He asks if Joseph came by, and Aurelio confirms it. John asks Aurelio for a ride and leaves immediately. Later that night, Vigo calls Aurelio to ask why he hit Joseph. At first, Vigo is angry, but when he learns that his son stole John Wick's car and killed his dog, he calms down. Vigo's tone changes from calm anger to disappointment and fear. To deal with the issue, Vigo meets Joseph at his house. He gives Joseph a drink, compliments his jacket, and then punches his kid in the stomach twice to scold him. Vigo reminds Joseph of who he wronged and orders him to stay. Vigo tells Joseph that John Wick used to work with him until he met Helen and chose to quit. John had a reputation as Baba Yaga, the boogeyman, the man summoned to assassinate the boogeyman. Vigo recalls seeing John Wick kill three men in a bar with a pencil and emphasizes how dangerous he is. When John wanted to retire and marry Helen, Vigo gave him a tough task involving multiple high-level assassinations. To Vigo's surprise, John succeeded, and his efforts were crucial in establishing the Tarasov Syndicate. 
As Vigo explains John's infamous achievements, Joseph looks terrified. If John came after him, there seemed to be no hope. Regardless, Vigo decides to call John and try to resolve the matter. John returns home, goes to his basement, takes a sledgehammer, and breaks the floor. He reveals many guns and gold coins. He gets a call from Vigo but hangs up, signaling that there's no turning back. With no other choice, Vigo sends a team of 12 hitmen to John's home that night to kill him. John easily handles the 12 hitmen and defeats them with ease. In the final moments, he fights the remaining few, ultimately stabbing the last guy through the heart. Suddenly, a police officer named Jimmy arrives at the front door. John knows him and casually asks if he's there due to a noise complaint. Jimmy agrees but notices the body behind John. He questions if John has returned to his old ways, hinting at the lifeless body. John claims he's just cleaning up, and Jimmy walks away to deal with the aftermath and remove the deceased. After the cleanup, John contacts a crew specialized in underworld cleanup. It's clear they know this won't be the last time they assist him. Meanwhile, Vigo approaches John's acquaintance Marcus and offers him a lucrative $2 million contract to assassinate John. Vigo also instructs his assistant Avi to advertise the job to other interested parties. Marcus willingly accepts the offer. John decides to head to the New York Continental Hotel, a place exclusively for the criminal underworld. Continental hotels strictly prohibit assassinations on their premises. Among familiar faces, John recognizes Perkins and Sharon. He greets his friend, books a room using currency used by assassins, and meets the hotel's manager, Winston. When John asks about Yosef's whereabouts, Winston informs him that Joseph can be found at a nightclub called Red Circle. John heads to the club, where Yosef and his friends are enjoying themselves. He suggests an old acquaintance take the day off, and the man agrees. John enters the club, takes down two of Joseph's goons, and proceeds to eliminate several men guarding Yosef on the lower level. Yosef enjoys the night in a Russian bathhouse. A shootout ensues when they spot John. Despite getting stabbed, John defeats all the hitmen, loses Joseph as he escapes in a getaway car, and returns to the Continental Hotel. There's a rule in the hotel prohibiting mobs from causing trouble, and Vigo declares that anyone willing to risk killing John inside the Continental will be rewarded with double the promised amount, $4 million. Marcus, from a building across the street, aims at John in bed through a mirror. He notices someone entering and fires a shot to warn John. It's Perkins. She immediately starts shooting, but John skillfully dodges her attacks. She informs him that if she violates the hotel's regulations and murders, John for Vigo, he will give her $4 million. He struggles with Perkins until he has her in a headlock and offers her compassion in exchange for information. She informs John that Vigo stores the majority of his assets in a church basement. John knocks Perkins out and leaves her with Harry for one of their organization's gold coins. Perkins is shackled to a chair by Harry, who is unaware that she has dislocated her thumb and is slipping away. She exits the vehicle and covers Harry's face with a pillow before shooting him. John visits Vigo's hidden stockpile of cash and business documents in the chapel. Following the shooting of the other guards in the church, John compels the priest to lead him to the vault. He dismisses the ladies in the vault and sets fire to the entire structure. Vigo hears about the fire just as he is about to be trapped in a barrage of bullets from John. Despite killing the majority of Vigo's men, he is knocked unconscious when an SUV collides with another, pushing John to the ground. Vigo apprehends him and questions why he's gone to such lengths for vengeance over a car and a dog. Joseph took the puppy away from John, who claims it was a gift from his dead wife. 
He also warns Vigo that he has the option of handing Joseph over to him or dying with him. Vigo is amused and leaves him with his henchmen before leaving. He orders the man to suffocate Wick with a plastic bag and kill him. Fortunately, Marcus is watching from the next building and he shoots one hitman in the head to let John take out the other. John quickly gets his gun and shoots at Vigo's getaway car. John manages to take out every single man inside the car, leaving only Vigo alive with a huge gun pointed at his head. Vigo is forced to tell John that Joseph is hiding in a safe house in Brooklyn and also to remove the contract from his head. Inside the safe house, Joseph is playing games and having fun with his friends. He thinks the whole thing is just some casual nonsense. Outside the safe house is guarded by armed men, but none of them can stop John freaking Wick. He kills each one of the guards and storms the place, guns blazing. Joseph once again tries to make a run for it, but John catches him and finishes him off. After John's revenge has been satisfied, he thanks Marcus for helping him out. But little do they know that Perkins discovers the two of them communicating. She reports her findings to Vigo, and in response, he orders his henchmen to trap Marcus inside his house. The scene then cuts to Vigo calling John and elaborating to him that Marcus was subdued for failing to complete his job. As they attack him and are about to finish him, he puts up a last stand and takes out a few men but is fatally shot by Perkins. Vigo then heads to a helicopter that will transport him out of the city. The plan is for John to come to Marcus's house, where Perkins will ambush him. But she is summoned to a meeting with Winston, the proprietor of the Continental Hotel. They meet up and Winston informs her that she has violated Continental's rules, resulting in the revocation of her membership as well as her life. Upon discovering Marcus's lifeless body, John sets out on a mission to absolutely kill Vigo and everything that he stands for. He spots Vigo and their man on the way to the chopper and attempts to slam his car into them. Vigo orders Avi to assassinate John, only for John's automobile to slam into him. Vigo tries to force John's car off the cliff, but he survives. The two then battle in the rain hand to hand. Vigo tries to attack John, but John pulls the blade into himself to generate leverage and break Vigo's arm. Then he grabs the knife from his stomach and stabs Vigo in the neck. He abandons him to his fate. The scene then cuts back to the beginning, with John still bleeding out but determined to keep going after seeing the video of Helen. He stops at a dog shelter to tend to his wound. He also ends up adopting a pit bull before heading home. The pulse-pounding events in the heart of the action were only the beginning. The next chapter kicks off with John Wick on a mission to recover his stolen Ford Mustang from Abram Tarasov, Vigo Tarasov's brother. In response, Abram warns his men about John's impending arrival. Determined, John heads to Abram's warehouse to retrieve his car. However, Abram, seeking revenge for Vigo and Losef's deaths, sends his goons after John. Despite the chaos, John defeats the attackers and reclaims his car. In an unexpected turn, John decides to spare Abram's life on the condition that Abram stays out of his affairs. Accepting this truce, John returns home and buries the remnants of his hitman past, aspiring to lead a simple life as a widower. A few days later, Aurelio visits John to repair his battered Ford Mustang, mentioning that the repairs will take some time. As dusk falls, Santino D'Antonio, a notorious figure in the criminal underworld, pays John a visit. He reminds John of their shared history and the blood oath marker. Despite John's insistence on retirement, Santino launches a devastating assault on John's home, setting it ablaze. Against all odds, John and his dog survive the brutal attack. Seeking refuge, John turns to the Continental Hotel in New York City, seeking guidance from Winston. Winston, the hotel owner, reminds John that refusing the marker breaks two sacred underworld rules no killing on continental grounds, and honoring every marker. Faced with this reality,
John reluctantly fulfills his commitment. Santino tasks him with killing his sister, Gianna, to secure her seat at the high table. John agrees, and Santino assigns Ares, his bodyguard, to monitor John's mission. To prepare for the mission, John visits a tailor shop specializing in bulletproof clothing. In need of information about Gianna's whereabouts, he seeks a blueprint from a contact. Armed with this knowledge, John acquires weapons from a familiar shopkeeper, well-versed in his legend. The stage is set for John's journey to Rome, where he will confront Gianna and navigate the treacherous underworld. At night, John infiltrates Gianna's coronation for her seat at the high table and confronts her in a dressing room. Faced with certain death, Gianna chooses to take her own life by slitting her wrists. As Gianna takes her last breath, John shoots her in the head as part of the marker. Having completed his task, John is leaving when Gianna's bodyguard, Cassian, spots him and realizes John's purpose there. Cassian attacks him, and they get into a shootout. John manages to escape from Cassian and his henchmen, seeking refuge in the catacombs. However, Ares, the woman appointed by Santino to watch John, double-crosses him along with her henchmen, aiming to eliminate John. Backtracking a bit, Cassian catches up with John, leading to a fight that takes them crashing through a window of the Continental. Since no blood can be spilled on Continental grounds, John and Cassian sit at the bar to calm their nerves with drinks. John explains the marker and Santino's assignment to kill his sister. Cassian understands, but cannot let his ward's killer go unpunished. He pays for John's drink and leaves. Meanwhile, John spots Ares, Santino's mute bodyguard, who signals through sign language that she'll be seeing him as John heads back to New York City. Santino puts a $7 million contract on John, attracting hidden assassins in the area. Simultaneously, Santino meets with Winston, who requests a blood oath to confirm John's fulfillment of his commitment. Santino dismisses the need, assuming John won't survive his return to New York. Winston warns Santino of the grave mistake, emphasizing the consequences of betraying someone like John Wick. Returning to New York City, John faces a barrage of bullets from assassins eager to claim the $7 million prize. In the subway, a violinist attempts to kill John, but he subdues her. A heavyset Asian man meets a gruesome fate, and two men in the subway meet their end with a pencil in a brutal encounter. Cassian finds John on the subway, leading to a fight, where John stabs Cassian in the aorta, leaving him on the train. With severe injuries, John seeks help and offers a gold coin to a beggar. With the beggar's assistance, he extracts himself from the dangerous situation. Still in pain, John turns to the Bowery King, an underground crime boss, for aid. In this hidden place, his injuries receive attention, but John also requests weapons and assistance in locating Santino for his mission. The Bowery King, though, has questions. He wonders why he should help John. In reply, John explains the serious outcomes if Santino secures a seat at the high table. The Bowery King would lose his power, his resources would shrink, and he'd lose control over his underground networks. The idea of John Wick taking on a high table member sparks the Bowery King's interest. After weighing John's points, the Bowery King decides to offer assistance. He hands John a gun with only seven bullets, one for each million in the contracts, and guides John to an art museum where Santino is hosting a gala. In a tough spot now, armed with just seven bullets and Santino's location, John heads straight to the museum. He begins taking down Santino's men. Throughout the museum, John pursues Santino eliminating his remaining henchmen. Unfortunately, Santino catches a break when his mute security enforcer, Ares, arrives, allowing him to escape. John deals with the rest of Santino's henchmen swiftly, facing Ares in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The brutal fight ends with John defeating the woman. 
While this unfolds, Santino manages to reach the Continental, seeking refuge. Remember, there's a rule against killing inside the Continental. Santino believes he's safe there, thinking John won't breach the hotel to get to him as long as he remains inside. John finally arrives at the Continental after a while and asks Sharon where Santino is. John has been through a lot in the last few days. He's covered in blood and wounds, but he still appears to be firm and he is committed to getting things done the way he now wants. Sharon does not want to be on the other end of John's wrath, so he tells him where Santino is. Santino is at the Continental Lounge with Winston. John goes there. Upon seeing John heading towards them, Winston warns John not to act brashly by killing Santino in the Continental. If he does so, he's gonna have to face the consequences. On the other hand, Santino seems really relaxed. The man is enjoying his meal, and he is dead sure that as much as John wants to kill him, he is still not going to kill him in the Continental Lounge. John, on the other hand, is sick of Santino. He's been through because of Santino. Santino is the man who destroyed his house and forced him to get back to the life he had left behind. So at this point, John says enough is enough, and without thinking, he completely ignores the warnings of Winston and kills Santino. After killing Santino, John gets out of there at once. He goes to his old house and reminisces about the time he spent with his late wife during their stay in the house. He recalls many beautiful memories of the beautiful time he spent there with his loving wife. John goes with his dog to meet with Winston at the park. Winston informs John that because he killed on continental grounds, the high table has doubled the contract and sent it to every assassin across the globe. Winston must mark John as an excommunicado, but he gives him one hour before the contract takes effect. It then becomes evident that every single person in the park is an assassin, and they have their eyes on John. John tells Winston to let everyone know that if they go after him, he will kill them all. Winston agrees. John leaves as Winston puts the word out. Every passing person looks at John, Knowing who he is and what they want from him, John is forced to take the dog and keep on running. Amidst the chaos and shattered alliances, a new chapter unfolds. John runs through New York, hurrying because time is running out for him. He sees a guy in a beanie, a spy for the Bowery King, in an alley, so he jumps into a taxi. But the traffic is stuck, and he only has 20 minutes until he's officially in trouble so he decides to leave the cab. Before he starts running again, he gives the driver a gold coin for his dog's safety at the Continental. In the library, John discovers a secret compartment in a book with coins, a cross, a marker, and a photo of him and his wife. A scuffle with a big guy named Ernest happens among the bookshelves, and John uses the book itself to take down Ernest. Even though he wins, John gets stabbed in the shoulder, so he goes to the doctor's place. With only five minutes left, the doc helps, but he has to stop stitching halfway. After fixing himself up, John follows through on a strange request. He shoots the doctor to show he's following the excommunicado rules. As he leaves, a bunch of assassins target him. He goes into an old weapons shop and uses classic weapons to fight fiercely. More attackers show up on the street, leading to a showdown in a stable with horses. John uses the powerful kicks of the horses to beat his enemies. He gets away on horseback, but has to deal with two motorcycle pursuers, whom he takes care of. Surviving all this makes John's bounty go up to $15 million. He seeks refuge at a theater and asks the director for help to get to Casablanca. To seal the deal, he gives the director a cross he found, and the director marks him with it. At the same time, a mysterious woman enters the Continental and gives a coin to Sharon. Winston finds out that an adjudicator is in town, checking out Santino's body. The adjudicator insists that Winston steps down for not sticking to the no-bloodshed rule. 
When she meets the Bowery King, she tells him to leave because he helped Joan. But the Bowery King refugees, standing firm in his position. In Casablanca, Joan faces hostility, attacked by three assassins. Amid the skirmish, the hotel manager grants him amnesty, sparking discontent among the assailants, leading to a gunshot intervention. The man guides John to the Continental Hotel in Casablanca, where he notices pictures of a woman and her daughter. Two fierce dogs appear, and from the shadows emerges the hotel manager, Sophia, who shoots at John. His bulletproof suit saves him, and he presents Sophia with a marker, a life debt for saving her daughter. Despite her plea, John insists she lead him to her former boss. Meanwhile, the adjudicator meets Zero, a man at a sushi shop. Recognizing the high table's coin, Zero understands her mission, to hunt down John and deal with those who aided him at the theater. The director, unaware of her guard's slaughter, watches her student's ballot. The tranquility shatters as the adjudicator and Zero condemn the director for aiding John. To prove loyalty, Zero inflicts painful cuts on her hands. John and Sophia head to the desert. John fulfills Sophia's debt by signing the marker with his blood. In the desert, John collapses after a day and night of walking. In the Bowery King's complex, ninjas attack. And the adjudicator punishes the Bowery King with seven cuts for aiding John. In the desert, a cloaked man finds John, who wakes up in a tent facing the Elder. The Elder gives John a choice die or return as the Baugi man. John chooses to live, pledging to kill Winston. He cuts off his wedding ring finger as a pledge of fealty. Back in New York, two assassins confront John but are cut down by ninjas. The ninjas take John to zero, and they are about to fight when school children interrupt. John escapes, killing two motorcycle ninjas and taking a motorcycle. Zero and his ninjas chase John on the freeway, but he kills sword-wielding opponents while driving at high speed. Zero pursues John into the city, but they crash near the Continental. Since John has his hand on Continental grounds, Zero cannot kill him. Charon takes John to a waiting room, and Zero follows. Here, he confesses how much of a fan he is. He tells John that they are the same, but John doesn't agree. John reunites with his dog but instructs him to stay. Once Winston is ready to see him, Winston meets John in a glass room used only when one needs to see what their opponent hides under the table. He knows John is here to kill him and prefers to be killed by a friend, but tells John that there is another way. He can pull the trigger and sell his soul forever, becoming the boogeyman and working for the high table. Or he can stand and fight against the high table, eventually dying as the man his wife loved. Man, his The adjudicator arrives to discuss Winston's decision to step down. Unyielding, Winston refuses to abdicate his position. She inquires if John intends to carry out his mission to kill Winston. He declines. With these refusals, the adjudicator announces the deconsecration of the Continental. Business, including violence, is now permissible on its premises. Winston and John are now open targets, and a squad of the High Table's finest enforcers are en route, anticipating the impending chaos. Winston reinstates all of John's privileges, noting the necessity for a substantial arsenal in the armory. John is briefed about the High Table's improved armor, prompting the armorer to recommend a more potent caliber of ammunition. As the battle nears, Winston takes refuge in the armory safe, leaving John, Sharon, and a few dedicated men to hold off the High Table's impending onslaught. The High Table's forces are heavily armored, forcing John to engage them at close quarters. Meanwhile, the adjudicator contacts Winston, questioning the longevity of his defense. Interested in her taunts, Winston ends the call prematurely. The initial wave of high table enforcers kills all the staff, leaving only John and Sharon standing. 
John tries his best to do what he can with the limited impact his bullets are doing. He gets up close and personal, and after firing underneath their helmets, he manages to take out a decent number of assailants. After meeting up in the armory, both John and Sharon prepare for the incoming attack. Sharon hands John a powerful shotgun designed to penetrate the tough armor of their adversaries. As the second wave of enemies storms the Continental, John and Sharon efficiently take them down with their upgraded shotguns, easily cutting through the improved armor provided by the high table. Following some additional kills using his pistol, John faces the barrel of an enemy's gun but is rescued by none other than Zero. A pursuit ensues throughout the building, leading to an intense showdown in a glass room. Engaging with two agile ninjas, their battle results in shattered glass cascading around them. Ultimately, John triumphs over them using their own sword and continues his ascent up the stairs, where Zero taunts him through a glass barrier. Suddenly, John is ambushed by Zero's elite henchmen, the Shinobi. They playfully taunt and assist John, mocking his perceived slowness and laziness due to his recent retirement. Shaking off the weariness, John transforms his belt into a weapon, launching into a grueling third round of combat. As the fight persists, a fatigued John employs unconventional tactics including powerful kicks and ear slaps, culminating in a forceful slam that shatters the glass floor beneath them. Despite the shinobi's efforts, they struggle to recover, allowing John to rise and continue his pursuit of Zero. Upstairs, John locates Zero and a fierce sword duel ensues. The battle is back and forth, lasting a significant amount of time. John, Utilizing Zero's disappearing technique, gains the advantage and delivers a lethal sword strike through Zero's chest. Both men, exhausted and injured, sit together. As Zero succumbs to his injuries and collapses, dead, he speaks about the thrill of the fight, expressing confidence that he will catch up. John dismissively replies and leaves him behind. Following this act of resistance, the adjudicator reaches out to Winston, proposing a parlay for the benefit of both parties. Winston agrees, and they convene on the roof to discuss negotiations. The adjudicator warns that this is just the beginning and predicts the inevitable downfall of the Continental Hotel. However, Winston remains undeterred, confidently emphasizing his deep connections to the city and his ability to reclaim the Continental, declaring himself as the embodiment of New York. John heads to the rooftop, where the adjudicator, in a surprising turn, interprets Winston's show of strength as a demonstration of loyalty to the high table. She reinstates the Continental and reaffirms his position as its manager. However, she insists that something must be done about John Wick. Winston takes action by shooting John multiple times, and the force propels him backward until he plummets off the roof. He tumbles down multiple structures that somewhat cushion his fall. The adjudicator, appeased by this turn of events, makes her exit. However, her satisfaction is short-lived, as she is informed upon re-entering the Continental that John's body has mysteriously vanished. Equally alarmed, Winston agrees that they cannot afford to have a vengeful John Wick seeking retribution. Quietly, he utters the phrase Baba Yaga, acknowledging the legendary reputation of their new adversary, their new a And now, having triumphed over the initial onslaught, the adjudicator initiates a parlay with Winston. Winston, now in a formidable negotiating position, strategically used John Wick as a bargaining chip. However, in a sudden turn of events, Winston reaffirms his loyalty by abruptly shooting John off the side of a building. This fatal fall leads John to take a perilous descent back to the streets below. Despite the Continental being restored to its former state, John Wick's body is nowhere to be found, 
it comes to light that the Bowery King has survived and, harboring intense animosity, has been recovering from his injuries deep underground. His profound desire for vengeance is fueled by one motive, John Wick's refusal to embrace death's inevitability. From the concrete battlegrounds, our protagonist leaps into a world where danger knows no borders. In New York City, where John Wick and his pit bull are staying with the Bowery King. John is hitting a board until his knuckles bleed and the Bowery King comes in and asks if he's ready to go after the high table. John just says, yeah. Then, John goes to Morocco, where he chases some guys working for the Elder on horseback. After dealing with them, John confronts the Elder for his ring, but he's told that the ring is gone. Despite that, John goes ahead and takes down the Elder before returning to New York. Winston and Sharon are called by the Harbinger to meet the Marquis de Gremont, who was sent by the High Table. They find out about the Elder's death, and the Marquis scolds Winston for not killing John. As a consequence, the Marquis condemns and blows up the New York Continental. Winston is now excommunicado, and to make it worse, the Marquis shoots Sharon in the chest. Winston stays with his friend as she dies, saying it should have been him. In Paris, there's a blind assassin named Kane. His daughter Mia is playing the violin in the park. The Marquis asks Kane to go after John. Kane says he's retired, but the Marquis threatens him if he doesn't follow the high table's orders. John goes to the Osaka Continental, managed by his old friend Shima Zukoji. His daughter Akira works there. Koji agrees to hide John secretly, but Akira doesn't trust him. Then, the Marquise's right-hand man, Chiti, shows up with his hit squad to lure John out. Koji's guards fight them off with arrows in the dark. When the hitmen reach the roof, John fights back, and Koji's guards take on the rest. Kane arrives and starts his own fight, using traps to hear where his targets are before using his sword and gun. Akira joins the battle but gets wounded. John helps her and Koji escape while he keeps fighting. Kane and John cross paths, both former friends. Kane is hesitant but goes after John for Mia's sake. John and Kane have a short fight before John escapes. Amid the gunfire, a tracker named Mr. Nobody and his German Shepherd are nearby. He kills some of the gunmen going after John. Mr. Nobody wants the contract on John's head too, but he says, the current $20 million is not enough, so he's currently helping John. As Koji and Akira are running away, they come across Kane. He and Koji are also old friends, but Koji won't let Kane go after John. They have a sword duel. Though it seems Koji can leave, he keeps fighting until Kane lands a deadly blow. Akira holds her father as he dies and tries to grab his sword to kill Kane. He advises her against it, so she doesn't suffer the same fate as her father. He promises to see her again. Akira goes to the train station, finding John and blaming him for her father's death. She tells him to kill Kane, or she'll do it herself. Winston and Bowery King meet, aware that being close to John makes them targets. Meanwhile, the Harbinger talks to the Marquis about the unnecessary bloodshed at the Osaka Continental. The Marquis insists it's necessary not only to kill John Wick, but to destroy the idea of him as an untouchable and unkillable figure. Mr. Nobody visits the Marquis, demanding a $23 million contract for killing John. The Marquis impales his hand, making him choose between pulling the knife out or pulling his hand out to reveal his ambitions. Mr. Nobody pulls his hand out, cutting between his fingers, and the Marquis agrees to honor his request. John meets Winston at Karen's tomb, offering condolences for the loss of his friend. Winston wants to get back at the Marquis, so he tells John that to win freedom from the high table, he must challenge the Marquis to a duel. Although high table duels were believed to be myths, John can only have support from his family 
and the rest of Roma severed ties, seeing no other way. John agrees to seek them out. John heeds to Berlin and enters a church. As he approaches the altar, the priest unexpectedly shoots at him, commenting on his nice suit. Meanwhile, Marquis talks on the phone with the tracker, stating that either John dies or him. Back in the church, John's family tortures him, blaming him for ruining everything. They plan to kill him until he brings up the one-on-one -on -one duel. John suggests that if they help him take down the man who killed their father, they can fix his ticket and welcome him back into the family. Wanting a way in, they send Claus to assist him. They all go to a kingpin, who laughs at the situation as Cain enters. John realizes he's been set up by his family, who betrayed him to save themselves. Tensions rise as Cain and the kingpin point their guns at each other. The tracker arrives as an unexpected guest, and the three men decide who gets to kill John through a card game. In the chaos that follows, with shots fired and everyone turning against each other, John navigates through the club, taking down every adversary in his path. He eventually catches the kingpin, chasing him down the stairs and killing him. John keeps a tooth as evidence, then returns to the church where, surprisingly, his family accepts him back and initiates him. Winston enters a room where Marquis is taken aback by his presence. Winston hands him the notice for the duel. The terms state that if John wins, he gets his freedom along with Winston's title and a rebuilt hotel paid for by the high table. Marquis informs him that Winston is the second, and the outcome is either leaving as a champion or in a grave. John is swiftly escorted to a table, facing Marquis. They draw cards to determine the duel's details, set for sunrise with pistols. However, Marquis replaces himself with Cain. Leaving, John is joined by Cain, who states he won't fight. Marquis assures that John's victory means freedom for him and his daughter. John returns to the church, meeting Cain for a friendly chat about their loved ones. Cain emphasizes that if it comes down to him or his daughter, it must be him. Later, John descends to an abandoned station, encountering the Bowery King. The Bowery King hands him a suite, emphasizing the need to look his best, whether he's heated for a wedding or burial. Meanwhile, Marquis confides in his confidant, expressing doubt about John's chances of reaching the duel. His confidant comprehends and begins searching for John. The bounty on John has escalated to a substantial $26 million, prompting a citywide alert for every criminal to eliminate John Wick, seen as a disruption to their way of life. John proceeds towards Sacré-Cœur, drawing the attention of numerous assassins. He engages in street battles, navigating the chaotic traffic around the Arc de Triomphe, either shooting assailants or letting them meet their demise in collisions. The high table monitors his movements, leading to more assassins converging on him. Entering a warehouse filled with adversaries, John employs explosive rounds to eliminate them. Concurrently, Mr. Nobody aids in dispatching some of the assassins and communicates with the Marcus, demanding a higher fee. Eventually, the Marcus agrees to a $40 million contract, attracting more desperate hitmen into the fray. Finally reaching the steps leading to the Sacré-Cœur, John dispatches more assassins before facing off against Chiti, who sends him tumbling back down the steps. Kane arrives to aid John, helping eliminate Chiti's henchmen. Meanwhile, nobody joins the fray, seeking revenge on Chiti for throwing his dog into traffic. With a collective effort, they bring Chiti down, with the dog delivering a painful bite to his sensitive region, and nobody ensures Chiti won't pose a threat by putting a bullet in his head. To add insult to injury, the dog even relieves itself on Chiti's face. John narrowly makes it to the top just as the sun begins to rise. John and Kane, armed with pistols, engage in a traditional duel. Both manage to hit each other twice by the third round. 
Cain shoots John in the gut, but John refrains from firing. The Marquis orders the coup de grace, wanting to be the one to kill John Wick. However, Winston intervenes, calling the Marquis arrogant and reminding him that John didn't fire his last round. It's too late for the Marquis to realize his mistake as John swiftly ends him. The Harbinger then declares that both John and Kane are free from their obligations to the high table. John descends the steps, taking a moment to reflect on Helen, whispering her name before slumping over. In his final moments, John Wick meets his end as a free man. Winston and Bowery King carry out John's wishes, burying him next to Helen with a tombstone that reads, Loving Husband. Reflecting on the uncertainty of John's destination, BK asks Winston whether he believes John is in heaven or hell, to which Winston responds with uncertainty, saying, Who knows? The two depart, with Bowery King taking on the responsibility of looking after John's faithful dog.